All right. I, I, I would like to sort of begin the, the next panel, and I don't think these panelists really need any introduction, but I, I, I do need to say a few words about them. The full bios would take a very long time to read, so I'm going to give an abbreviated encapsulation of, of their lives. Let's talk about Monty Alger first. Monty had received his bachelor's degree and uh, the chemical and the practice school degree here uh, at MIT. He got the practice school degree in 1978. He was a practice school student at, at Oak Ridge National Lab and at GE stations. Following the practice school, he uh, received his PhD in, uh, in chemical engineering at the University of Illinois, working with Chuck Eckert, who is also a graduate of this program, if I recall. Uh, he was hired by Jeff Chester, the station director for the GE Silicon and Oral Products stations in 1982, and he and I actually joined MIT at exactly the same time, so we have a long history together. Following a long and illustrious career in industry, Monty returned to the uh, ac academia and is now the Professor of Chemical Engineering at Penn State and Director of the Institute for Natural Gas Research. So that's Montgomery Elja. He likes to go by Monty. Yeah. Ken, Ken Smith is the Edwin R. Gilliland Professor Emeritus of Chemical Engineering at MIT. You'd think he looks far too young to have retired, but he has retired. He did his undergraduate work at the Institute before attending the practice school, where he had participated in stations at American Cyanamide and ESSO. Following the practice school, he went on to get his doctorate under Harold Mickley. He's also held numerous uh, uh, positions in the MIT administration, including Department Head for Chemical Engineering and Associate Provost and Vice President for Research. And in fact, uh, one of the reasons why I'm, I'm standing here where I am right now is because Ken uh, took Jeff Tester away from being a practice school director to run the energy lab, and they needed somebody to fill his spot. So that was uh, how I got twisted. Okay. We'll get the story right in a minute. <laughs> okay. I'm a little afraid of that. Uh, he also, Jeff is also, Jeff Tester is the Kroll Professor of Sustainable Energy Systems in the School of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering at Cornell University. He serves as director of the Cornell Energy Institute and is a fellow in the Atkinson Center for Sustainable Future. Prior to his appointment at Cornell in 2009, Jeff, uh, Jeff was the H.P. Meissner Professor of Chemical Engineering here at MIT, where he served as director of the practice school from 1980 through 1989. He received his bachelor's and master's degrees from Cornell before completing his PhD at MIT and the Bob Reed and Jeff Margolis. Um, I should also add that Jeff was very persuasive. We heard from a couple of others today how persuasive he was in getting students to go to the practice school. Well, he was persuasive in getting me to participate as a station director after my first year here. And it was a trans transformational experience, I must admit. So thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Anyways, I, I would like to uh, help. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Ken, Monty, and Jeff to the uh, stage. And they will give us some discussion. I'll leave it up to you guys. Mm -hmm. All right. You want, the, you want that thing there? <laughs> I, I'm trying Would to charge that light, but maybe I can't do that. The, uh, when Alan asked us, the three of us, to speak to you, I understood his intention to be to try to give you some perspective of a span of time during which the practice school underwent a very substantial evolution. The, uh, and the three of us span that kind of, kind of remarkably that we saw so much of it, but, but we did. Uh, so I'd like first to talk about my experience as a practice school student and then jump forward to events significantly later and talk about the changes and the differences and why those took place and what got preserved and what got lost and so forth. So to start oh, with uh, we're safe. my own experience at practice school, I was in the undergraduate class of 58, uh, had no intention of going to practice school. This is a theme that I gather you've heard a number of times before. Uh, <clears throat> But Bob Reed was the new director of the practice school at the time, and he cornered me in the corridor at least twice. 
and uh, sort of twisted my arm and said, this is something you really have to do. And Bob could be very persuasive. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there was an upperclassman who had already been, and whom I knew rather well, Eddie Najar. And uh, Eddie said, so sang exactly the same tune. He said, this is something you have to do. So I changed my mind about leaving the institute with only a bachelor's degree and said, these two guys have to be right, and I went to practice school. So as Alan indicated, uh, in the fall of 58, uh, we had a remarkably wonderful arrangement in that both groups lived in a single location halfway between Cyanamid's plant in Boundbrook, New Jersey, and the SO refinery at Bayway. And so the two groups lived in a common place. When the turn reached the halfway point and we should switch stations, there was no need to move. We just did it. And, uh, and of course, the two stations were enormously different. Uh, the cyanamid was e everything, I think literally everything in that plant was batch. Uh, a lot of the products were high value. You had the freedom to go out and tinker with those batches so you could do a lot of things. Uh, but, but it was sort of rough and dirty and uh, try it and see how things work. The uh, SO, of course, was completely different. It was much more sophisticated. Everything was continuous. The ability to do anything on the plant was close to zero because nobody wanted you to tinker with anything. Uh, but there was great laboratory space. And, uh, and we had great direction in both sites. There was a, a director and an assistant director in both sites. The, they gave us terrific direction, and I'm sure that you've heard about the various no. things for which no. practice school is famous, uh, such as presentations that make sense and the like. I'd like to emphasize one that's a little bit different in that coming out of an undergraduate program and going off to practice school, I'm used to a format in which you take exams and Maybe you can't work the exam, but at least you can trust the problem statement. <laughs> you get out to practice school, and the first thing you say is, you know, this damn statement doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> and this isn't even the real problem. <laughs> And it was the first time I learned that it is extremely important to formulate the question. That uh, until you've formulated the question properly, you can't possibly make progress. And that's the very first thing I learned at practice school. Uh, there are lots of other things you'll learn that it's like you don't have time to get very much data, so you better try to be really good at extracting it as much information as possible from what little data you have. Uh, but the one about formulating the question was the most important, I think. Many years later, I got to know Francis Lowell, who was then provost here at MIT, and he, he had a different way of saying the same thing, really. Uh, the first time he said it to me, I was, it took me back because I said something, and uh, I asked him some question, and he said, I disagree with your question. You know, <laughs> and uh, the sounds uh, when he first said it, of course, it sounded totally absurd. Uh, but uh, it's a good, it's an important point. The uh, so the format, in some ways, the practice school was in wonderful shape in '58. The uh, Bob Reed was a fantastic director. The, he was new in that position, or relative, I think one year into it. The, uh, we had great directors. The directors tended to be MIT fresh PhDs or about to be PhDs who uh, saw the practice school director role as one that would give them an experience that might lead to an MIT faculty position. Uh, might not, but if they went elsewhere, it would be valued wherever they went as well. Uh, the assistant directors were typically master's students who saw it as a, 
an excellent opportunity to do something very different than they would ordinarily do in a master's program. So, uh, so in the fall of 58, things were really pretty good. Let me now fast forward to uh, the late 70s. And the, at that time, things were not so good. That uh, in 58, the, I think it's fair to say that the unit operations paradigm came close to defining chemical engineering. There were some hints on the horizon that these guys in Wisconsin and Minnesota were going to do something different, but it was still on the horizon. And uh, by 78, or thereabouts, the uh, things were really different. Uh, most of the academic chemical engineering enterprise had switched to what was termed engineering science. Uh, unit operations was uh, not held in high esteem. Uh, MI, the MIT department was slow to adapt to that. It was generally thought that one reason for being slow was that the MIT department had tended to hire its own graduates. And uh, by virtue of that, it had failed to understand how the profession was changing and allowed itself to get behind rather than ahead. So uh, the department had changed back in the 60s and begun to say, look, we got to hire most or all of our new faculty from elsewhere, not from within the department. And, uh, and therefore, automatically, new directors at practice school are probably not going to get an MIT uh, faculty position. The, uh, so it, the role of director became less attractive. The, uh, in the meantime, everything had gotten more expensive. The uh, host companies were therefore more reluctant than they had been to serve as hosts and pay some of the bill. Uh, the funding of graduate students had shifted almost entirely to a mode in which they were supported by research contracts. Master's degree students are not very effective in that role and not very cost effective. So that the master's program had not gone away by any means, but it had become a lot smaller. The, uh, so the, and there was a tendency for the PhD students to say, practice, I don't need practice, I need engineering science. And so the PhD students tended not to go to it. So the practice school was in trouble. Uh, and uh, I think it's fair to say it was a near-death experience. The, and the faculty, every, there was a strong split. Uh, everybody began, to, by the mid to, mid to late-ish 70s, everybody understood that things could not go on as they were, that things had to change. The, uh, and the question was how. Faculty was split. Some of the faculty said, practice school is an idea whose time has come and gone. It's time to do away with it. Uh, there were other faculty who said, no, no, no. The, the practice school does things that we can't possibly do in a classroom, and it's very important to preserve that. And this discussion, and it was a discussion, it was to, to the credit of the department, it was not something that generated a lot of animus, but it did have strong differences of opinion. The, the dean tended to say, you know, this is expensive. It's different than everybody else, so it's probably not very good. Uh, <laughs> you know, and it's just a damn nuisance. I'd probably be better off without it. And so there was no help whatsoever from the dean. And the department was struggling to resolve its own internal dispute over the question. Uh, and to its enormous credit, it was really the visiting committee that resolved it. The committee, visiting committee had on it a number of people who had been to the practice school who felt that the practice school experience had been enormously important to their subsequent careers. 
And they said, this, this is something you have to keep. And to, even more to their credit, they, they did not merely exhort us. They said, we think it's so important that we're going to make a very substantial contribution to it. And so that those people on the visiting committee who had done so well stood up and said, we're going to help provide the financial support that this can put this back on its feet. And so it's a remarkable example of people coming forward uh, when an enterprise needed help. The, uh, the biggest question that leaves, obviously, is OK. Uh, we've got a vote of confidence in it. We've got some monetary support for it. We have to make sure we have somebody that can really make it happen. And happily, uh, there'd been somebody around who had the experience of being a student in the department, who had gone off and run the Oak Ridge back to school station, who had been on the faculty. And well, the faculty had their divisions earlier about whether or not the practice school should be continued. Faculty was an absolute unanimous opinion that the right person to do it was the next speaker. And that's Jefferson. <laughs> he was then off at Los Alamos having a wonderful time and doing things he loved to do in the energy area. And uh, it was difficult to pry him loose, but uh, that happened, and he took hold and ran with it, and we owe him a great debt of gratitude for, for what he managed to achieve. So Jefferson, take it on from there. Thank you. So we've had enough uh, of a formal presentation uh, today, and uh, I appreciate the remarks that Alan made and, and Ken in getting started. But I, I've got to tell you what it was like when I started to be barraged with phone calls uh, coming from people like Ken, Fritz Meissner, Bob Reed, Sam Fleming, who's sitting there, a number of others, as well as members of the visiting committee saying that, gee, you might want to think about coming back to Cambridge. And Sue and I were very happy, as, as Ken said, in New Mexico. Uh, I was working on an exciting project. Many of you know about that. And um, it was really important to think about, well, why would I even think about changing? So uh, I want to know, the, a lot of the people that are sitting in the room are, are the reason why I felt it might be important to come back and see if I could help the practice school out in t uh, during this time. So I'm going to go, and I want the students who were at Oak Ridge with me, and there's a lot of them in the room, to stand up for a minute. And there's many that are here, as you can see. <laughs> and uh, it's you guys that I have to thank right? <laughs> for all that you did. Because if I wasn't in Oak Ridge for those two years, I never would have been able to realize uh, what a paradigm this educational paradigm is and how much it means to try to sustain it. It's not only unique, as we've heard so much about today, but uh, it represents uh, something that is very important, I think, to, to MIT to keep going. And I can't help but think that we're in the 100-year the <laughs> So this is the 100th year anniversary of not only the practice school, but of our national park system. Maybe some of you have thought about this. <laughs> and uh, maybe it's just not a coincidence, but uh, the national parks, as uh, Ken Burns talks about this in his uh, wonderful review of the national park system about one of the crown jewels of the United States. Well, I would like to say that the practice school is the crown jewel uh, of, of MIT uh, with respect to education. It, it represents uh, our, our, our teaching hospitals. <laughs> Uh, for generations of students and faculty, station directors alike, provided the kind of framework for con connecting fundamentals uh, in a pretty different way to real problems and whose solutions actually mattered. Not homework problems, but that mattered to people who were out in the host companies and the like. But uh, when all is said and done, you still have to be able to think with all this evolution that we've heard about, these marvelous talks today, 
and in the video <clears throat> of how much has changed, there are a lot of things that are still the same. You must think in practice school. You must be careful about these getting the problem right. Not only working hard, but stay focused on message. Make sure that you communicate. We heard a lot about oral communications, but another part of the practice school was written documentation, and I think Monty may say a few more things about that, but that was certainly an important legacy to be leaving behind uh, at the stations, and uh, a lot of it was used for years after we left. Uh, important part of the whole story. So let me move to, uh, I have six points, and then I can move on, I think, to uh, let Monty uh, talk for a little while. The f and when I was thinking about coming back, and Ken has alluded to some of this already in his remarks, but uh, we had to kind of change a few things. It, it didn't require totally systemic change. The educational <clears throat> paradigm was there. Uh, the structure of the programs was pretty good, but it was pretty clear that we needed to involve more doctoral students in, in the program, and they needed to hear about the practice school. Uh, when I came as a student, which, by the way, was 50 years ago, <laughs> uh, we were in Building 12, and I can remember my first sort of stroll across that lovely building looking at the names on the doors. Uh, and, you know, you start with Tom Sherwood and Hoyt Hoddle and Bob Reed, and uh, you move over to Thibault Bryan and Ken Smith and others into the inner corridor where the very young faculty were, like Sam Fleming, Sam Bodman as well, and others. And I didn't really, you know, make the computation at that point that all of those had practice school experience. So there were places I could go <laughs> and find out when people were talking to me about becoming a director at Oak Ridge as to what it might really involve. And uh, that has changed, as Ken's alluded to, and I think we needed to make awareness in general of the practice school much clearer, not only to the students who were there, and Brian gave a lovely uh, rendition here of how I recruited students who were MIT undergrads. Well, there's more to that story, too. That was a great technique I used, for sure, uh, in terms of, uh, but I learned a lot of that, as you can see from previous generations of, of faculty who were doing the same thing. But I had another uh, technique, and I'm not sure who told me this. It might have been certainly probably some former practice school director, but uh, was that when you have a student and you're talking to them, and I literally have them in the room, and they haven't filled out the application yet, I'm asking them, you know, well, what are you going to do? You know, when, when you, you, how are you going to optimize your education while you're here at MIT? And so they'd go on and on, well, I really want to do research, and I've got to learn all these fundamental technical things. And so then you'd say, well, have you thought about the practice school? Naturally, I would say that. And they'd say, no. I said, well, why haven't you thought about it? Because, uh, and so you get into this sort of debate with them. You should be trying to figure out why you wouldn't go to the practice school, not <laughs> because it's a really the only good option you have, right? <laughs> and uh, so this would, you know, it was usually a friendly discussion which went on for months sometimes. And uh, <laughs> I, I, I brought in a lot of extras to help with this. I know Alan's doing that too in, in bringing other students who've been back. We started, although the department, I think, feels this is now their annual meeting, it really started out as a practice school event uh, because we felt it was important to bring the host companies back and to sort of introduce them to uh, the new crop of students and so they could tell their side of the story. We wanted to bring the, the current directors and some of the current students back, so this was usually done at the break between stations. And we also wanted to acquaint a lot of our new faculty who had, weren't familiar with the program with what this uh, whole program was about. So I had another way to do that, and uh, <clears throat> I did that with... Uh, another form of recruiting, which was saying, I'm going up to the Albany Station or flying down to Oak Ridge or going to some, to Boundbrook or wherever, and you, I'd like you to come with me, uh, which would be some new faculty member who really didn't know what the practice school was. And so I dragged a lot of people who became eventually very famous, people like Bob Brown and others who, uh, who hadn't really seen this. He came out of a Minnesota background, which was very different than what we had. So. That was helpful, but I think what happened, and I, we started it <clears throat> in, in when I was coming back, but Alan certainly has continued this, which was increasing accessibility for, for doctoral students. So with the way the, the qualifying exams were set up and, and the difficulty of getting started with research, it made a lot of sense to have a summer program and to do this in a way where you gave a lot of accessibility. It also helped out in the five-year program for students that wanted to start a graduate program beyond their their fifth year and, and could do this uh, quite easily by going in the summer. So 
that's been sort of institutionalized. And the other part of it, and it's, I'm almost to the end now, has to do with recruiting practice school directors. And uh, <clears throat> Alan talked a little bit about how Monty might have been recruited, but the real story is a little more complicated than that. Uh, so <clears throat> when I was driving, first I, when I was driving across the country, had decided to accept the job, uh, we had we were minus a director at the at the Oak Ridge station. This is just before your time, so here I am driving across the country with our five-year-old daughter and Sue, saying, "Gee, I have to recruit a director now. I'm not even there yet. Haven't even gotten a paycheck yet." So I, lo and behold, a few phone calls. I, I think it might have been some one of the faculty or Bill Rousseau or somebody suggested, "Why don't you call Judd King up? Because he might have an idea." You saw the picture of him in, in the video. So he. I called him, naturally he said, well, you might want to give this young man a call, Charlie Byers, who some of you may remember. And so I called Charlie up. He had worked at Polaroid. Polaroid had sort of had a meltdown. And he was perfect. So I said, Charlie, uh, how would you like to start like in three days? <laughs> and he said, no problem. <laughs> so, so that took care of that one. But then soon after that, we had the other event, which was the current director, uh, Herb Wood, was going to finish his term, and, and I had to find a director for the Albany station. So, so how are we going to do this? So I said, well, we have to advertise for this. And there was a little bit of resistance when I said, maybe we should do an ad in the New Sunday New York Times, because this might you know, get us connected with people. I didn't have enough time to do this. So I got a lot of flack from that, from <laughs> unnamed people. Not, not, the, not the people who are in this room, but the unnamed people who thought that was going a little bit beyond MIT should not have to advertise in the New York Times. You know, what, after all, we're well known. So I, we did it anyways. I caught, <laughs> and uh, lo and behold, uh, I get this. Uh, actually, it was your mother who called first, Monty. <laughs> she calls me up and says, my son may be interested in this job. <laughs> I said, God bless you, Mrs. Alger, right? <laughs> and uh, so that's the story, and it actually really did happen. As, uh, it, it, <laughs> it, it, turned out, it turned out Monty actually was working for Chuck Eckert uh, and doing his PhD at Illinois, and he also was a, was a practice school grad. But I don't think there was a conversation that predated the New York Times ad. So there are strange ways which we do this, but it, it becomes very important, I think, to get directors who are not only, you know, understand, I think, what the practice school is trying to do educationally, maybe through their own experience like Monty or like others in this room and myself included, to, to learn about that and to appreciate what it can do. But they have to be passionate about doing this. They have to be ready to work with the, with the people in the host companies. I had 60 years, uh, 60 students in two years, and uh, I can't think of a program that did more for me professionally in that short period of time in learning how to manage multiple projects, students with all kinds of different personalities, a whole bunch of host company, in this case it was laboratory personnel who had very different views on what was right or wrong or what we should be working on. And uh, so it's a remarkable opportunity, I think, for a young professional, whether they go into teaching or, or whatever. So those were the, thing, the things I tried to do, and it was easy. I had, uh, we had talented people. <laughs> and a good program, so it, I shouldn't really, I don't really want to take too much of the credit for this because it's the people in this room that made it all possible. So thank you very much. Okay. Nice. I'd like to clean up a few of the facts that have been shared with you so far. I want to step back a second and um, write, thank Alan for his gracious introduction. And after his introduction, Ken leaned over and said, set me up for the slaughter. <laughs> and I appreciate your vote of confidence. The New York Times story is indeed true. Um, what actually happened was I was getting out of graduate school, and I was interviewing and planning my future life in a very deliberate, normal way, thinking about oil companies and so forth, and I got a phone call from my mother. And she said, I saw an ad in the New York Times for a practical station director. Didn't you go to that? And I said, yes. So she sent me the article, and then I think Jeff covered it from there. 
Well, what I will share with you is, is you, as those of you who Jeff, know Jeff Test who understand this, those of you who don't, be forewarned. <laughs> so if you understand what a black hole is, there's a concept called the event horizon. <laughs> and once you're inside the event horizon, you are sucked in and never seen up again. So I think of this as the tester event horizon. <laughs> and every single student in practice school in the tester area has experienced the tester event horizon. And let me tell you, when you're in that black hole, there actually is life. It's a wonderful experience. <laughs> so I want to share some of the things that I went through as, as a director. And as, as Jeff had mentioned, I had been a practice school student. And when I returned to the GE station as the director, I thought, wow, this will be terrific. I know the practice school. I, I, I was a student at GE in Oak Ridge. I know the place. And I was totally wrong. <laughs> so what happened was, when I joined GE, it was, it was a unique station. had two separate locations, GE Silicones and Waterford, New York. And the Norell business was part of GE Plastics. And while I had imagined that a company, when you think of a company, you think of a company as an entity that has common practices and behavior. The GE Silicones business was more of a traditional, they wore ties, they spoke very formally, they debated in a very, in a, very a way I would expect. And it was structured, and GE Plastics, having had a history of the being the business that Jack Welch started, was a lot more like Animal House. It was. <laughs> totally uncontrolled, and the idea of sitting down and actually thinking in, in a deliberate way, there were very different requirements in both of those sites. And as we got into it, and I, and I, and I got to GE, um, there had been a little trauma with the station. It had started up and, and, and been going, but there were a few things that we wanted to address to, to further develop the relationship with the, with the GE company. And what I discovered was is everyone was very pleasant, everyone was very nice, and I found a few consultants that were very helpful to, to, to help, help develop some projects. But I found there was also sort of a distance. And what I came to learn was the, the GE leadership, the vice, both division vice presidents would show up at final presentations. And you begin to appreciate the politics of an organization. Because when you have a student group standing up and saying, boy, I don't know why you people are so stupid. Why do you do the things this way? When you do that in front of the division vice president, they tend to ask questions, and it creates a lot of trauma. So during the first year, we worked very hard to figure out how do we develop relationships and trust, and how do we develop something where we're not seen as squirrels in the attic, but we're actually very valuable a part of their business and, and what they were trying to do. And that took a lot of time and effort, but extremely valuable. And I would say that becoming part of a company, we weren't a part of the company, but we're a part of what the company was trying to do. But the best quote I heard from one of the students during that time, I, I, we, we used to talk about this a lot, was from Mike Glodak, who said, being a practice school is like standing up in fr front of a room of people your father's age and telling them what they're doing wrong. <laughs> and that, in many respects, did capture the whole spirit of what, what the practice school is about. And I remember Je when Jeff Tolan was assistant director, we were, Jeff would call me up from Cambridge, and he'd say, Monty. Give them some heat and mass transfer problems. Give them some, give them some thermodynamics problems. And, I, and Jeff would say, does Jeff know what this place is like? And I'd say, don't tell him. <laughs> but, but, but what we did is we got to know the people in GE. And while we had those kinds of skills in the projects, we went from having structured problems where we had laid out the problem ahead of time in a lot of detail. And we stepped back and, and started acting more like a consulting company. So we got into projects where we would take a problem and let the students then work with the company to figure out what is the problem, per Ken's comment, which is what's the problem we want to solve, and then how can we go after and, and solve that? So I remember one project in particular, it was, a very, it was a bizarre project. We were building a fume silica plant, and we were con concerned that we were going to gas the people in the fume silica from the vent incinerator next, door, uh, next to it, I think. And so it was a question of doing some Gaussian plume modeling and seeing if there was going to be a potential problem. So we had the problem statement written all up. We had the correct problem statement, we thought. And I remember Randy Field came in. He was a student. He'd gone to Caltech. And he came into my office. And he said, I was at Caltech. And there was a guy, Fred Scher, who was doing atmospheric modeling. It was SF6. I said, fantastic. I said, why don't you call him up? So we did. He sent us a bunch of little sampling stations. He sent us the, the, you know, how to do all the analysis and do modeling and do sampling. And we then organized with, with Fred to send the samples back to him and do the analysis. We get the analysis back. We make the plots. And you know, it was going to be fantastic. And along the way, it turned out that it was very important to have the right weather conditions. And the students made calls to the weather service every 10 minutes. 
and I know that because we got the telephone bill. <laughs> and that telephone bill from that group had about 19 pages of calls to the Weather Bureau. But the other part about this was it turned out the perfect day for doing the test was a Friday night. It was relatively cold, and they didn't have enough people to do the sampling. So I went over and stood on the, the steel with, with the other students, and every 30 seconds, someone would say, pull. And we manually pulled back little vials to take 30-second samples for three hours in the cold. It was unbelievable. But the result of that was also unbelievable in that we sent the results back to Caltech. They did the analysis. We got the results back. We made the plots up. And it showed remarkable results. And we got insights that we would never would have expected. And that launched into a whole set of other projects that GE then sponsored in terms of looking at potential failure and safety hazards from emissions and what would be the consequences and evacuation plans. All happened because a student had a thought that would change the way we approached the problem. And, and, and the people in the business were extremely supportive and enthusiastic and, and helped to make that, make that a reality. And I say those are the types of projects that, with time, I found to be the most valuable. The ones where you point in a direction and you let the combination of youth and enthusiasm coupled with experience and uh, practice and bring those two worlds together to create new thoughts and new directions. Along the way, we created the AB projects. We had different ways to try and work to bridge both MIT and, and student concerns. And, and, and we, we, we tried to change the basic operation to be more integrated in, but still create a really great learning environment for, for students. We also had um, another responsibility, which was, I say, the personal dynamics. We managed apartments. We, we took care of student living. And we also had a, uh, something we called station seminars. And station seminars started out formal, and they became less formal with time. And we, in the middle time, we used to go to the Purple Pub. We drink beer. And I came back to a Cambridge presentation once and had to give an update. And I went back home and told Jeff. I said, Jeff, get a camera. We're going to start taking pictures. And we're going to have fun. And that then evolved into where we then had, we went from beer and pizza to mixed drinks. This is when Chris Guzzi joined. And we had a $5,000 budget we could spend every year. And the mixed drinks were like 2 to 3x what beer had been. And Chris was paying on his credit card. I said, this is fantastic. I'm out of here. We'll blow to five grand. And he's going to have to cope with it. <laughs> but we had, a, we had an advantage because we had a budget item called interstation travel. When we traveled between the two sites, we could put money there. So we rationalized to ourselves, if we're drinking a little bit on the way between the stations, we'll call it interstation travel. So it wasn't, <laughs> we didn't spend $4,000 on liquor and beer. We spent, you know, we did some interstation. It was, it was not Wells Fargo-like. It was, it was <laughs> So those are some of my experiences. And I'll just briefly add a, a couple points that later on in life, I did join GE. But then I ended up as the technology leader for both the Nareel business and then subsequently the Silicon's business. And when I joined those businesses as the technology leader, you, know, you have lots of responsibilities and, and, and things you have to do. But I had memory of doing projects in both of those businesses. I knew more about what was going on in those, both of those businesses than a lot of people. They couldn't believe that I knew this much. And I would cite reports. I would tell them about studies. And I'd tell them to go read the practice school reports. And those reports were the best documentation and the best reference material that we had in both of those businesses. It was, it was really quite a remarkable thing. And something which is, is not, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very, very important point to, uh, to keep in mind. And I, as I've gone through the years, I've, I've, I've reflected on this as part of the inside of the, the tester event horizon. And I, I will tell you, this practice school program, it's amazing. It's here for 100 years. It's durable. A lot of the experiences you hear are very common. But the ability for students to get to work together, to struggle with this idea of the con controlled train wreck, it's actually very true. And all the things you learn are all the things you need in life. And you will never know why you need these experiences until you go to the practice school. And for me personally, it's been a marvelous experience. And I think this 100 years is, shouldn't be the this celebration of 100 years past. We should think about how do we take what this program has created, add it to what's going on in the world today, and think much more in a much more forward way to take this notion of entrepreneurship, engagement, project-based learning, and, and build on this model and extend it in all sorts of new, in new directions that uh, technology has enabled. So thank you very much.